Hello and welcome to the History of the Germans, episode 146, The Return of the King, Henry VII's Journey to Rome. In the winter of 1310, the Emperor-elect Henry VII, not yet 40 years of age and every inch a king, appears in Italy. An Italy torn apart by incessant violence between and within the cities. Allegedly, it is a struggle between the pro-imperial Ghibellines and the pro-papal Guelphs, but 60 years after the last emperor had set foot on Italian soil, and 7 years after the Pope has left for Avignon, these designations have become just names without meaning, monikers hiding the naked ambitions of the powerful families. The poet Dante Alighieri projects the hopes of many desperate exiles on Henry when he prays that we who for so long have passed our nights in the desert, shall behold the gladness for which we have longed. For Titan shall arise Pacific, and justice, which had languished without sunshine at the end of the winter solstice, shall grow green once more. A lot to get done for our Luxembourg count and his army of 5,000 men. Certainty of death, small chance of success, what are we waiting for? But before we start, let me remind you that the History of the Germans podcast is advertising free, thanks to the generosity of our patrons who've signed up on patreon.com slash historyofthegermans and on historyofthegermans.com slash support. And this week, as promised, I would like to highlight some of you who have been so kind to promote the show these last few weeks. And that list starts with Cyrom, whose article on Medium about the intersection of history podcasting and AI has been hugely interesting and has brought so far a staggering 68 new listeners. You can find a link in the show notes. I would also like to thank Zeta of One, Some Dude, Bloke in North Dorset, Tom Brückel, Mark Greenwald, Gerko Wolfswinkel and Michael P. Bornemann for their relentless support on Twitter slash X and elsewhere. And on Facebook that list is even longer, so I'm sure I have missed some really important people, but let me thank Kent Lindahl, Katarina Russell Head, Michael Kufaru, Eric Anderson, Piotr Katzmarczyk, Simon Wild, and the incredibly generous Nina Bugarigo. Thank you all so, so much. But now, back to the show. Last week we left Henry VII, still only King of the Romans, in Turin, home of his brother in law, Count Amadeus of Savoy. With him is an army of about 5,000 men recruited amongst his friends and family from the western side of the empire. There are his two brothers, Baldwin, the young Archbishop of Trier, and then the great chivalric knight Valram, now also a Count of Luxembourg. Of the prince electors and the other great imperial princes, only Leopold, the Duke of Austria, has come along. A modest force, but by no means the smallest ever for a medieval emperor-elect. Two things were supposed to smooth his way down to Rome. For one, Pope Clement VII, the first Pope to have left Rome for good and was now residing in Poitiers under the watchful eye of the King of France, in an act of defiance, had promised Henry VII to personally crown him in Rome on February II, 1312. And secondly, the citizens of Italy were tired of the perennial strife between and inside the cities a struggle often described as the fight between the Guelphs and the Ghibellines. News of the arrival of Henry VII in Italy were greeted with great enthusiasm by many. The great poet Dante, at that point a political exile from his hometown of Florence, wrote, Rejoice, therefore, O Italy, though that art now a subject of pity even to the Saracens, for soon shall thou be the envy of the whole world seeing that thy bridegroom, the comfort of the nations and the glory of thy people, the most clement Henry, elect of God and Augustus and Caesar, is hastening to the wedding. Dry thy tears and wipe away the stains of thy weeping, most beatrice one. For he is at hand who shall bring thee forth from the prison of the ungodly and shall smite the workers of iniquity with the edge of the sword and shall destroy them. End quote. Such enthusiasm amongst the oppressed, combined with the papal blessing, put Henry into a much more attractive position than many of his predecessors had enjoyed in the past, and it presented him with three possible options. 
Option one would be to just ride hell for leather down to Rome, get crowned, get home, barely touching the sides. That was the easiest option. Even the cities that weren't excited about the presence of a new emperor on Italian soil would not risk an outright war to stop someone who would be come and gone in a year. That had worked well before, for instance under Henry II, Conrad II and Henry III. But this option would also mean abandoning any attempt at rebuilding imperial authority in Italy. If Henry wanted to exercise power in Italy, as the great Hohenstaufen had done in the past, he could step up as head of the pro-imperial Ghibelline faction, defeat the Guelphs and then establish an imperial administration in each of the cities. That is option two, and that was the way Frederick Barbarossa and Frederick II had pursued their policies with, well to say it mildly, mixed success. Option three was a new option. Because Henry could establish himself as the bringer of peace, as an impartial judge, neither a Guelph nor a Ghibline, who reconciled the warring factions. Submitting to a just imperial ruler could work for both parties, at least in theory. The end of the incessant warfare would bring peace and prosperity to the merchants and artisans who were usually leaning on the Guelph side, whilst the imperial projects in the Holy Land and Eastern Europe would provide employment and excitement for the warlike Italian aristocracy who were usually supportive of Ghibelline positions. Now no brownie points for guessing which option Henry VII preferred. Here is the great man himself, summarizing his position. Has God, the supreme teacher of justice and equity, given a holier commandment than that which says, You shall love thy neighbor as yourself? But is there any difference to be made between Christians? Who is my neighbor? Is it the German, the Frenchman, the Vandal, the Swabian, the Lombard or the Tuscan? Or who amongst you would like to answer the Ghibelline? Don't you dare. What have I come for? What have I been sent for? That I, as a godless successor, to take up the errors of all my predecessors and continue them? That I should reawaken the old divisions? And Pope Clement, who occupies God's throne on earth, should he have called forth our army and engraved his mark on lead, so that I might subjugate the Guelphs to the Ghibellines or the Ghibellines to the Guelphs? What has become of our justice and equality? Some have assumed names under the guise of the empire, others under that of the church, names which Lucifer the Fallen had given them and which can only generate hatred. I, then, who go forth as the messenger of Pope Clement and under his sign, which is my Christians look to me as the second light of God, I am to appear here to please some and betray others? Not so, as I declare to you here loud and clear. End quote. What a fine speech by such a fine man. Love thy neighbor, don't repeat the errors of one's predecessors, and a promise not to betray those who put their faith in him. Very exciting new approach. Let's see how that works out. For that we need to dive a little deeper into the political situation in Italy and if you think the situation in Germany at the time is confusing, you ain't seen nothing yet. I had to flick through the podcast, the books and history courses in search of a neat storyline that helps me to cut through the events on the Italian peninsula between the death of Frederick II in 1250 and the arrival of Henry VII in 1310. What I found can be summarized in the words of the immortal Meryl Streep. It's complicated. We still have these city communes that had made life a misery for the Hohenstaufens. But something has fundamentally changed. During the days of the Lombard League, the cities were each dominated by an aristocratic oligarchy, the consuls or senators. This structure was copied from the ancient Roman Republic, where most decisions about war and peace were discussed amongst the city leadership and then brought to the people for approval. These republics were incredibly warlike. If you remember episode 56 when we talked about the tiny city of Crema that resisted a huge army of Frederick Barbarossa for over a year. That is the one where Barbarossa had the prisoners from Crema tied to his siege engines to stop the defenders from shooting at the expensive equipment. But to no avail because the hostages encouraged their friends and family to rain stones and burning arrows on the attacking towers even if that meant maiming and killing them. 
During the 13th century, this fierce spirit waned away, in line with a change in the social structure of the cities. The merchants and the artisans had become richer than the land-owning city aristocracy. Because trade had kept expanding throughout the 13th and 14th century in both scope and scale. One legacy from the Crusades was a dense network of trading posts across the Mediterranean and the Black Sea, run by the maritime republics of Venice, Genoa and Pisa, which brought luxury goods from the East to Europe. Marco Polo had returned from his travels to China and Persia in 1295. Already in 1245, a Franciscan monk, Giovanni del Pian del Carmine, had travelled to the Mongol Khan's court as an ambassador of Pope Innocent IV. The exchange with the East was not limited to knowledge and luxury goods. To feed the ever-growing city-states, they needed to import grain, and some of it, if not lots of it, came from what is today Ukraine, already then the breadbasket of Europe. Passing goods through from the east to the west wasn't the only source of wealth. Artisans in Italian cities produced various goods much in demand across Europe. Florentine red cloth was much en vogue, as was Venetian glassware from Murano or Milanese armour. Other than the Hansa, the Italian merchants formed larger and larger firms that set up their own offices abroad and they competed intensely with each other. They believed in a winner-takes-all model of capitalism rather than the supportive network approach favoured in Northern Europe. Production too was proto-industrial, inasmuch that, for instance, Florentine cloth makers would employ hundreds of workers in their workshops where production was split into multiple stages to increase productivity. All these activities required a lot of capital. Banking began in the Italian cities well before the 12th century as crop finance. Farmers would receive a loan against their future crop, which allowed them to buy seeds and feed their family until harvest. Mostly run as private operations, in 1282 the Republic of Venice opened the first state bank that accepted deposits and issued crop loans. The Crusades led to material expansion and internationalization of banking activity that also created many of the financial tools we still use today, such as bills of exchange, forwards and futures. As trade expanded, so did banking activity. Most bankers were merchants at the same time. They would fund risky ventures such as transporting a large consignment of silk to Bruges by assembling a consortium of merchants who would share the risk. Alongside that, they may issue a loan to the junior trader who would lead the expedition. This diversification of risk and provision of finance allowed Italian merchants to expand far faster than their counterparts in the rest of Europe, except maybe for those in Flanders. As time went by, these banking houses would find themselves lending to kings, popes, emperors and their cities. These loans were extremely risky, as the king, pope, emperor or city council could not be made to pay once the loan was due, as the Bardi and Peruzzi of Florence will find out to their detriment. Hence most of these loans were heavily collateralized, giving the bankers the right to collect taxes to exploit mines or other sources of income, sometimes even castles or whole territories. Interest was very high, reflecting these risks, which meant a lucky banker ended up being a very, very rich banker. The usual estimate is that even an average Florentine banker in 1310 had more ready cash than our friend Henry VII, which meant they had a lot, a lot more money than the aristocrats who were ruling their city. The difference in resources caused frictions. But the bigger issue was that the consuls and senators did not run the city in the interest of the merchants and artisans. A merchant or artisan may be able to defend himself if need be with a sword, but that does not mean they wanted to fight wars for war's sake. But war for war's sake was very much the aristocratic raison d'etre. The other flashpoint was justice. A functioning system of courts that enforced contractual obligations was a key building block in any successful economy, and hence a key concern for the burghers. The city aristocrats regarded justice as a source of income from fees and bribes. Throughout the 13th century, burghers formed associations or guilds to represent their interests, and as the struggle between the aristocrats and the burghers grew fiercer, the city constitutions changed. Many communes had already called people from outside as podestas, 
to police the city streets and issue justice since the late 12th century. But now we find many cities appointing a Capitano del Popolo, who was to represent the interest of the people, aka the merchant and artisan classes. And this role became ever more powerful as the merchants became ever more wealthy. These two opposing groups did adopt the names of Ghibellines and Guelphs. The aristocrats would usually become Ghibellines and the burghers tended to be Guelphs. The word Ghibelline refers to the castle of Weiblingen near Stuttgart, which was the name of Agnes, the ancestor of the Hohenstaufen, and the name they actually used when referring to their own family. So these were in principle the supporters of the emperor. The word Guelph is an Italianate form of the name Welf, the family of Henry the Lion and the alleged antagonists of the Hohenstaufen. Though the name referred again to a German family, the Guelph's allegiance lay not with them, but with the Pope. Bankers were particularly prone to be Guelph since the papal curia was in constant need of cash and in return appointed the Lombard and Tuscan bankers as tax collectors for the increasingly sophisticated set of church levies. But like everything else in these convoluted times, this is not 100% the case in each city, but it's not a bad yardstick. As we head into the 14th century, a couple more things are happening. Unsurprisingly, as the merchants and bankers get richer and richer, they gain the upper hand over the aristocratic oligarchs. More and more cities become Guelph, most visibly in Tuscany, where the hitherto modest settlement of Florence starts to dominate the region. In 1289, Florence and its Guelph allies beat the Ghibelline resistance based in Arezzo comprehensively. But Guelph or Ghibelline became increasingly hollow slogans. The internal struggles over political allegiance turned into a competition between dominant factions, each picking one of these names. Or in Florence, where the anti-Ghibelline sentiment was strongest, the main factions became the White and the Black Guelphs. The name White and Black Guelphs goes back to a fight within the city of Pistoia between the children of the city leader from his first marriage, who were older and whose hair had already turned white, and the second set of children from a second marriage, who were still young and sported some luscious black hair. Seemingly by 1300, hair color was as relevant a criteria for political affiliation as support for the imperial or the papal cause. These fights for supremacy between two factions, each headed by a clan chief, were as disruptive as the previous fights between aristocrats and merchants. One minor improvement was that the party which temporarily gained the upper hand would only execute a small number of their rivals and then exile the other prominent members of the opposing faction. The reason for this leniency is pretty clear. Neither party had a distinctly different program to the other. Hence, cities were usually split 50-50 between the two factions. To be able to run the city, the winning side still needed to be able to cooperate with the defeated faction, and that meant they could not kill all their brothers, uncles and cousins. The downside of this policy of casting out your opponents was that there was constantly a government in exile trying to ferment unrest inside the city and gathering support on the outside. This perennial fear of revolt then forced the city rulers to spend vast amounts of money and effort to gain favour with the people. In Florence and Milan, all the streets, not just the main square, were paved. The courts were made impartial and staffed with professional judges trained at the great universities of Bologna and Pavia, and then there were the public works, the cathedrals and churches, the city halls, and so on and so on. There we are. Every city in Italy experienced regular convulsions as one family was trying to overthrow the other, not to implement any particular policy, but solely to gain power. And that meant each city had a large band of exiles roaming the peninsula in search for allies that would help them oust their opponents. And these exiles now flocked to the court of Henry VII in their hundreds and thousands, all hoping he would bring them back into their hometowns and restore them into their previous positions. On November 11, 1310, Henry VII arrived in Asti, the then most powerful city in Piedmont. Today, the city is famous for truffles, for wine, and its palio, a bareback horse race around the triangular piazzas Vittorio Alfieri. I only found out about this delightful combination just now, and Asti went straight on to my bucket list. But in the late Middle Ages, Asti's speciality wasn't wine or truffles, but banking and civil war. 
The Solari family of bankers had recently taken control of the city and had expelled their rivals, the Castelli. And guess who was in the entourage of Henry VII entering Asti? The Castelli. The Castelli were Ghibellines, as were the majority of exiles that had joined Henry VII in Turin. That wasn't because Henry VII favoured the Ghibellines, but it was simply that the Ghibellines were losing almost everywhere and hence the chances of being exiled was a lot higher if you were a Ghibelline than if you were a Guelph. So Asti became now the prototype of Henry VII's new policy of peace and reconciliation. Upon arrival, he gathered the whole population of the city in the square in front of the cathedral, where he received the oath of allegiance of the city council and then in return confirmed the city's ancient rights and privileges and even offered further benefices should they behave well. That's not such a bad start, but as so often with prototypes, version 1 did not work out so well. It's not clear what happened that same evening or that same night, but the next morning, according to the chronicler of Asti, Henry VII no longer thought this was enough. So he called the whole population back onto the market square. His right man, Niccolò de Bonsignori, declared that the emperor was not satisfied with being just the overlord of the city. Then a cheese merchant stood up and shouted, I suggest, O Lord, that you should receive the unconstrained power over the city and the contado of Asti. The imperial representative shouted back instantly, Those of you who agree with the words of the cheesemonger shall remain standing. The rest shall sit. Well, that led to instant tumult. Everybody was jumping up, shouting and screaming. Some said yes, yes, but the majority shouted no, 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 no. Meanwhile, the imperial notary concluded quite accurately that since hardly anybody had sat down, most of them were standing, the motion was carried, and therefore Henry VII was now the absolute ruler of Asti and its contado. Happy with version 2 of his grand project of peace and reconciliation, Henry appointed Niccolò de Bonsignori to be the new Podesta, Capitano del Popolo and just overall boss man of Asti. Niccolò then told the Castelli and Solari to kiss and make up, and as punishment for their obstinacy, ordered the Solari and the other Guelphs to provide funds to replenish the imperial purse. This imperial purse, smaller as an average Florentine banker's safe, as I said, was rapidly depleting as more and more exiles had raised to his banner. Initially, these Italian supporters were more or less impecunious exiles. But after Henry had taken control of Asti, a veritable snowball effect set in. The rulers of Verona, the Della Scala, headed by Can Grande, which literally means big dog, sent an embassy extolling their long and loyal service to the empire, going back to Barbarossa's day, but which weirdly did not include any tax payments owed under the Peace of Constance. But who cares? He was a big dog, and he brought some pretty big men on pretty big horses. The Pisans, more fiercely Ghibelline since time immemorial and sworn enemy of the Gals of Florence, sent 60,000 ducats and a few hundred knights, promising the same sum should the emperor honour them with a visit. And then the appeal widened, and several Guelph city lords appeared. The rulers of Vercelli, of Pavia and of Lodi came to submit to Henry VII. By doing so, these men defied the rulers of Lombardy's largest and most powerful city, Milan. As the chronicler Albertinus Musato speculated, they may have done that to please the king or out of fear of their fellow citizens at home who had been enthusiastically celebrating the return of imperial splendor. And they were not the only ones. More and more Gulf leaders came to believe that joining the imperial cause was the best way to preserve their position. And with every powerful family that joined Henry VII's army, this logic became more and more convincing. The one who was not yet convinced was Guido della Torre, currently Capitano del Popolo and all in big cheese in Milan. The della Torre were Guelphs and had swapped control of Milan with the Ghibelline Visconti family since 1259, roughly every 10 years, culminating in the execution of 53 Visconti supporters by a certain Napoleone della Torre which was followed by the capture, torture and murder of said Napoleone by the Archbishop of Milan, Ottone Visconti. 
In 1302, Matteo Visconti, who had taken over from his uncle the Archbishop and had been recognized as imperial vicar by Adolf von Nassau, was ousted by Guido della Torre, who could rely on support in the surrounding cities of Pavia, Lodi, Cremona, Piacenza, Novara, Brescia and Bergamo. Milan was the largest city in northern Italy at the time, the city of St. Ambrose, a great commercial centre, and by now the overlord of most of the surrounding cities, including Novara, Vercelli, Brescia, Bergamo, as well as Monza et Pavia, the traditional coronation sites for a king of the Lombards. Now, when Henry VII saw the lords of Pavia, Vercelli and Lodi riding into his camp, he realised that the hold of Milan over its neighbouring cities was crumbling and that he could now go for the big prize and take his beta-tested reconciliation policy to the capital of Lombardy. Now, Guido della Torre wanted none of this, no reconciliation, no peace, and above all, no return of the hated Visconti into his city. Henry VII therefore opted for a display of strength. He took his now much enlarged force and paraded it below the walls of Milan. And very visibly amongst his men were the lords of Vercelli of Pavia and of Lodi, the city whose rulers had brought the Della Torre back into Milan nine years earlier, and who may now well be able to bring Matteo Visconti back into Milan. Still, Della Torre refused. He had begun discussions with Florence, whose radical Black Gulf leadership was organizing resistance against Henry VII. And there was also King Robert of Naples down south. Ever since they had wiped out the Hohenstaufen, the kings of Naples had become the dominant power on the peninsula and the leaders of the Guelphs. Their tentacles reached well into Lombardy and Piedmont, where Asti and Alessandria had once sworn allegiance to the Anjou. King Robert was also papal vicar in Romagna and Tuscany, and Florence had once made him their podesta. And Robert was a cousin of King Philip IV of France, who was increasingly concerned about the shenanigans his former vassal was getting himself into down there in Italy. But time was pressing. Henry's army was now camped out in Vercelli a day and a half's ride from Milan. And worse, Guido's nephew, the Archbishop of Milan, hated him. Hated him a lot, and for good reason. Guido had his father thrown in jail to rot for fear of competition. So the Archbishop and the Visconti were gathering support inside the city of Milan, whilst the lords of Pavia, Vercelli and Lodi worked on the remaining loyal cities of Brescia, Cremona, Como, etc. And that standoff lasted 30 days. Guido hoped for reinforcements to come from Tuscany and the other Lombard cities, whilst Henry hoped that Guido's regime would simply collapse under the external and internal pressures. But time ran out for Henry. He needed to make a move, if not because he was running out of cash. He took his army from Vercelli, which is west of Milan, and marched it towards Pavia, which is just south of the great city. Della Torre watched the army passing and thought his lucky day had come, and the dreaded imperial force would head south to Rome never to be heard of again. But at the last minute, Henry turned his forces east and marched towards the gates of Milan. De La Torre knew that his citizens weren't prepared to fight a long and painful siege and that his enemies inside would find a way to open the gates to the imperial army. He caved and he invited Henry VII into the city and accepted the king as his rightful lord. The conquest of Milan turned the snowball into an avalanche. One city after another swore allegiance to Henry. Brescia, Cremona, Bergamo, Vicenza, Padua, as well as the communes of the Emilia-Romagna, came to hand over the keys of their cities and to receive a new governor chosen by Henry VII. Only the Tuscan allies of Florence and Bologna, the largest of the cities in the Romagna, refused and instead fortified their walls. And Alessandria, down in Piedmont, also failed to send a delegation as it was occupied by a garrison of King Robert of Naples, who is now going from mildly concerned about the Count of Luxembourg playing emperor up in Savoy to full-on panic stations. Now, Meanwhile, Henry VII went from strength to strength. His entrance into Milan turned into a triumph. Accompanied by Guido della Torre, Matteo Visconti and the Archbishop, three men who hated each other from the bottoms of their hearts and whose rivalry had brought untold misery to the population of Milan, were now riding side by side, guiding the future emperor the bringer of peace and prosperity into Italy's foremost city.
To literally crown his success, Henry VII planned the next act of his drama, emulating the great Charlemagne and many of his Ottonian, Salian and Hohenstaufen predecessors by planning to put the iron crown of the Lombards on his head. He invited all the important families of Italy to come to the church of Sant'Ambrogio, the venerable house of St. Ambrose, on January 6, the festival of Epiphany 1311, to witness his coronation. Initially, there was a bit of confusion, since nearby Monza would have been more appropriate, or Pavia, on account of its early submission to imperial suzerainty, but Henry insisted on Sant'Ambrogio in Milan. A great festivity took place before an enthusiastic crowd of princes, nobles and common people. Crowned with the iron crown of Lombardy, the king and his wife rode out into the crowd on horses clad in scarlet and purple cloth, he carrying a scepter of gold that ended in the shape of a lily in his right hand. He was every inch the king. Tall, with reddish blonde hair that reminded the crowd of the Merovingian and Lombard rulers of old. He wore his hair in the Gallic style, short in the back, as you can see with most UK teenagers today. His perfectly symmetric shoulders sit atop a strong upper body and well-proportioned legs and feet. He speaks slowly and rarely, usually in French, but he has some mastery of Latin as well. And his wife, albeit already 36 years of age, had maintained much of the beauty she had been famed for in her youth. She was blonde and of pale complexion. Beautiful cheekbones, the top of her nose a little reddish, the mouth small, and she seems to be perennially smiling. She gave good counsel, knew how to put her arguments across, and was in no way haughty. Indeed, some complained that her friendliness towards the lower classes went beyond of what was appropriate for a queen and a future empress. A perfect royal couple that had subdued Italy in merely three months, not by war, but by the promise of peace and prosperity brought to you by the just, the good emperor, the new Marcus Aurelius, Constantine, or even Augustus. There was, however, a little kink in all this royal splendour. The crown that Henry VII carried so majestically on his graceful head was not the actual iron crown of the Lombards, the one that contains a nail of the Holy Cross in an iron ring on the inside. That crown was nowhere to be found. The Della Torre had pawned it years ago to fund one of their endless wars against the Visconti. So a Milanese goldsmith was made to create a gilded wreath overnight that could possibly be called a crown. And like this crown, the empire that Henry VII had built was a rushed affair, an overnight success, a snowball that had turned into an avalanche. Summer is approaching, when snow turns into water, and the crown's gilded surface flaked, exposing the base metal underneath. How that will go is what we're going to talk about next week, and I hope you will join us again. And just before I go, please remember that the History of the Germans is advertising free thanks to the generosity of our patrons and that you can become a patron too by signing up at patreon.com slash historyofthegermans or on historyofthegermans.com slash support.